Hello and welcome to Theology Thursday at Grace Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Wesley and we are happy you're joining us today. And with me today we have our faithful Bible study members. Good morning, Ingrid. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Sandy. Pastor. And good morning, Loretta. Good morning. And uh, good morning to June, who's on the line as well. And yeah, so our icebreaker question this morning uh, has to do with our Bible readings for the Sunday. This Sunday is June 6th, and it is the second Sunday after Pentecost, lectionary 10. And the question is this, what is your family of origin? Or in German, as they say, your first family, right, Ingrid? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my family of origin is, um, I was raised by uh, my mom and dad, Ray and Marion, and, um, and I had one older sister, and uh, her name is Camille, and she's four years older than me. And uh, that was it, pretty simple. And I'll popcorn over to Ingrid. Oh, okay. Um, born in Germany, raised in Germany. Three more siblings, mother and father, and brought up in the 50s and 60s, so lots more tailored, shall we say, <laughs> and restrictive. Yeah. Uh, not like today, so. Yeah. And uh, I guess I was the last part of a generation that still was taught religion one hour each day at, in school. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sandy, I see you. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. My family of origin is uh, my mom and my dad, and they were from originally from the South, but I was raised in Ohio, and I have an older sister, five and a half years older, and um, I was brought up in the 40s, and we did not have religion here in the schools, at least where I was at that time, but we had we had good morals and good training, so from everywhere. So the religion was there; it just wasn't uh, mentioned specifically. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. And Loretta, how about you? Your family of origin? Okay, I grew up with um, my two parents, and uh, there were five children in our family. Um, I lived in the country until I was 10. You've heard me comment on that. I love living in the country. And um, my sister, Carol, died of multiple myeloma when she was 58. So I now just have my three brothers. My one brother is a year and a half older than I am, and I was the oldest daughter. So when you're the oldest daughter, it makes you a very responsible person because you yeah. learn to do, to do many things. And... Uh, so, and my three brothers are still living. They all live in Wisconsin. And um, unfortunately, my oldest brother, when I mentioned that, the year and a half older, has multiple myeloma. That is a very much an onset for older people. Um, it, you don't hear that as often in younger people. But anyhow, um, I still have the three brothers and um, had a good childhood. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for sharing. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it connects to our gospel readings. So let me pull up the readings. And our first reading is from Genesis. Would someone like to read? Oh, I love Genesis. I'll read Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis 3. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to <laughs> to be with me. She gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent took me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the ser serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for reading, Loretta. So what do we think about this passage from Genesis? Okay, I'll go out on a limb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice out on a limb <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it, it, it sounds like a bad beginning to me uh -huh. the man and the woman are already having trouble and the woman's dumb and gets tricked and i don't understand that's this this is the parts of the bible that i always say what uh -huh. i just put that in there so yeah. there i there i am just out there with it yeah good for you way to put it out there excellent yeah, what's up with this? Yeah, what is up with this? Yeah. Why, is this why, why do we start off so bad? Okay. Go downhill. It's <laughs> yeah. I, I think it comes down to mistrust. Totally mistrust. They mistrusted God. And, you know, that kind of sums it, which makes it a very difficult story. But it's the truth of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and if they had only trusted him and not the serpent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, because... It, I'm sorry. Uh huh. Yeah, go ahead. Go right ahead. To me, it also shows our weaknesses uh -huh. as humans and yeah. how many of us can be convinced other than be faithful to God by the third entirety to do something that's against God wishes. And that's what Genesis 3, to me, is talking about. I mean, they listen to the serpent, right? Mm -hmm. And who's the serpent? It's the devil. So they didn't believe in God as they thought they did. Mm -hmm. And maybe also because it's the beginning, mm -hmm. beginning of everything, beginning of humanity. Mm -hmm. beginning of uh, the world and uh, they didn't know God then as well as we do today mm -hmm. as we should do today so mm -hmm. I'm just kind of extensionism mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. <laughs> just trying to sink it forward so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good very good yes good good reflections and um, yeah it's it's a problem I mean you know um and and i guess that is the question what what is the problem what is the problem here you know there's presenting factors and then there's the deeper factors right so for example um when god is walking through the garden they hide because they're naked. Um, and in fact, Adam says, I heard the sound of you and I was afraid because I was naked. Um, so for some reason, Adam thinks that that's a problem, that he's naked. But God doesn't seem to really care about that, right? Right. It's not so much, oh, why are you naked? No, it's why do you even know that you're naked? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so Adam is either lying and not saying the truth, or he doesn't understand what the real problem is. Yes, well, well, I think when he said, um, I was afraid because I was naked, he's just throwing up a little excuse. Uh-huh. Um, but um, right. that's when God, God responds and says, who told you you were naked? Yeah. Have you eaten from the tree? So he caught him, uh-huh. Right. And then, and then real quick, rather than accept the blame... He puts it on the woman. He puts it on the woman. <laughs> and we've been suffering ever since. <laughs> well, 
Because she fell into that, she like thought this. she better feed him. Why did we start us off like this? <laughs> yeah, why did we start off like this? He, he could have made us good. Mm -hmm. Did God make us good? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> he made us. He made us in his image. Right. We're good. Yeah, it yeah. says it says in chapters <laughs> one and two, not only good, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The human beings. So we are made, we are made good. But we have our weaknesses. Mm-hmm. We're just not a hundred percent good. Not not a hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> um now, some people have flipped this on its head. Uh, particularly, there's, there's a, a feminist interpretation of this that says that Eve made history and Adam just dumbly followed along. You know, um, <laughs> you're right, yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, to, if you if you think about this as a a um, mythologically um, from when we transitioned from being animals to humans, right? Because animals don't clothe themselves, humans do, right? Um, most of the time, um, <laughs> and and so you know, was it was it Eve the one that had the sense to become aware, you know, um, and, and you, and you kind of ask, well, how can someone make that interpretation? And it gets back to, well, who's the snake? Because yeah, like you said, Ingrid, most of the time we've been taught or we assume that the snake is the devil, but where does it actually say that? In Genesis, it doesn't. It says that the snake was crafty, clever, um, but it doesn't say that the it doesn't explicitly say that that the snake was evil. And so again, some have offered interpretations to say maybe he wasn't. It's Mark. And Mark is with us too. Welcome, Mark. Oh, it's all right. Glad glad you're back from your uh, wanderings around the United States. Yeah, good to be good to be back. Yeah, good. Is this your birthday? Uh, no, Saturday. Uh, Saturday. 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 Oh, okay, I thought you said today, Loretta. No, Saturday. I said we have to sing to him today. Oh, right. We won't be. We won't be with you on Saturday, Mark, unless you're having a party. Yeah. <laughs> he might be having a party, but not inviting us. <laughs> I don't think they have an invitation. <laughs> Put him on yeah. the spot. Yes. So welcome, welcome, Mark. We're we're into uh, Genesis chapter three. Okay. And we we started off talking about how there seems to be some kind of a problem here, um, with man and woman with maybe evil and i was just lifting up a, a feminist interpretation that says that maybe it's not what we think maybe eve made history as being the first person sensible enough to put clothes on uh, and adam just sort of dumbly followed along um, and part of that interpretation is sort of questioning who is the snake um, because it, it does not explicitly say that the snake is the devil, although that is certainly a part of our tradition. Um, and to, to build on that just a little bit further, there were ancient archaeological um, evidence in the, in the Middle East that snakes were revered as, um, as not evil, um, but as clever, as, as a sign of wisdom. Um, so, so again, you, you have an alternative way of interpreting this passage. Um, 
so I'm, I'm lifting that up for your consideration. It's, it's, you know, I think it's one to think about. Well, it started out serving right away, didn't she? She made sure that Adam had food and she gave it to him. She served him. Um, I just needed to throw that in. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Yeah, if you have that and she was taking care of Adam and she ate first and saw that it was good and then gave it to him. And Yeah. Another interpretation of this passage has to do with family dynamics and the difference between a couple two and and three and this is one that psychologists um, and therapists write a lot about you know that basically the theory is that couples are very unstable that in terms of all the different um, configurations of human relationships um, long-term monogamous relationships are very, very powerful in, in the formation of, of civilized societies. And they are also very, can be very difficult to maintain. Um, and this story, and, and this is something I think you alluded to, Sandy, is right away you see the, the conflict between Adam and Eve as just being emblematic of, of the challenge of uh, long-term committed relationships. Um, and so that's another interpretation that says, uh, that, that speaks to the, to, the, to the challenge of, just like I said, of relationships, you know. Yeah. You know, Pastor, you got to love it, how people then analyze everything in and out, over and under, up and down, and they just cannot accept for how God manages us. <laughs> so, right. you know, they cannot accept that there's such a thing as space. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe I'm kind of old-fashioned and stodgy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think, I believe human on the whole are good mm -hmm. and try to do good mm -hmm. and be good. Mm -hmm. But then the serpent comes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with all its mm -hmm. gaudy goodness, you know. Yes, so. yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and that... Uh -huh. Go ahead. No, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So. Well, I think what I hear you saying is, you know, just the very, the plain truth of it is that they disobeyed God. Yeah. God said, don't eat. And they did. You know, and um, <clears throat> I almost hear you saying that just as Adam <clears throat> tries to be evasive to what had happened, even us in our own interpretation <laughs> struggle with owning up to the fact that we are guilty of disobeying God. Just plain yeah. simple. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sandy. They also blame each other. Adam blame Eve and she blames the serpent. And yes. Not my fault. Yeah. So sometimes I get letters as a pastor. Did I already say this? No. Sometimes no. I get letters, people just re reaching out and wanting help. And I gotten a couple letters from someone asking for help. And, and um, um, this, the, the way that they wrote their, their letter basically said that, you know, they're a good person, they haven't done anything wrong, and they've just suffered, you know, terribly their whole life. And people have let them down and betrayed them, you know, and it's, it's very, very sad to read. 
And the one part about the letter that I found to, to be interesting was the insistence this person felt of telling me that they hadn't done anything wrong at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it sort of made me raise my eyebrows a little bit because I think I do stuff wrong <laughs> every day. Um, I mean, truly, you know, I, I, I try my best, but I mess up a lot. And, and it, it was just a little surprising for me to, to get, you know, someone insist that they've never done anything wrong. You know, it's like, really, <laughs> you know, you, you must've figured something out that I haven't, you know, um, I don't know. You know, what do you, what do you think about that? Mm. Well, all from <clears throat> I'm going to mute you, Ingrid, and if you need to unmute, you can. Yeah, no, 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 no. I just turned it off, but okay. my thing came on low battery. Oh, so okay. I went and, and got my connectors here and plugged everything in. So hopefully. I see you soon. Okay, sounds I still good. can hear you. Good. So. Good. Okay. Oh, that's, why, that's why I could hear the numbers. I could hear it in the background. Um. So anyway, I raised, I raised, I, I wrote the person back and I, and I encouraged them and I invited them to worship and, and I shared the different ways we give material support, including, you know, our gift cards. Um, and uh, but it, like I said, it just sort of made me think that I, I see this even still today where we have a tendency as human beings to maybe have a hard time admitting our, um, our shortcomings, you know. Yeah. Uh, Sandy, you feel like it looks like you've got something you want to say. Well, I'm trying to think it through. I it's just hard to imagine somebody thinking they don't do anything wrong because there's so many wrongs you can do. Mm -hmm. You know, there, maybe the, maybe someone feels they don't do huge wrongs, that they're both basically nice, but you know, we still do, I think certainly everybody does at least little wrongs all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, even if you don't think you brought broke the one of the Ten Commandments, most likely you even broke one of those. But also, um, there's just oversight is wrong. It's something you didn't do mm -hmm. when you should have um, for right. your fellow man. That's that's wrong. Like, right. Yeah. Well, I guess it's how you how you think about what's wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with you, Sandy. I was thinking the same thing that that's all the little wrongs. Right. Mark, you got anything you want to weigh in on Genesis 3? Oh, well, it's just relative to, you know, current conversation about, you know, like doing things wrong. I, I think um, it really. For me, anyway, it breaks down to uh, how we are justified, and you know the claim that says, you know, I don't do anything wrong, or or you know, I will even endeavor not to do anything wrong, you know, in a related way. You know, that's self justification. That that's being you know justified because of my own abilities, and that's. Um, I think it's a way that we try to, you know, realize agency in the world, and um, there's, a, there's a lot of, of struggle where people, you know, either have or don't have agency and ought to have it, and maybe not ought to have it, and you know, it's it's just it's a it's a it's a whole hodgepodge of I this I this is why I love. Paul's thing about, you know, work out your own salvation with fear <laughs> because it's, you know. What do you mean by agency? I don't understand. 
control, like just, you know, realizing your own destiny, your own wishes, your own wants, your own desires, you know, just like what you're, you're, you know, you being you, you doing you, you know, and, and there's be um, stronger in yourself. Yeah. And yourself think, more. Yeah. Yeah. It's but some people are not able to. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Sandy can speak to that. It's a, it's all over the place. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it makes you think about what was it like for Adam and Eve being in paradise in the Garden of Eden, having all the fresh fruits and vegetables they could ever want. You know, like my, my wife, Sherry, is very good at hospitality and she puts out little platters and trays. And I'm always amazed the vegetables are just, they're there at the end. You know, everybody eats the chips and the cheese and the nuts and and you can count on you can count on that broccoli being there at the end. Broccoli will be gone. Huh? No peas will be gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, and the fruit, you know, the fruit will go, but it'll go, it'll go second to last usually. Um, the junk food goes first, right? It goes first, yeah. And so, Adam and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden with all the fruits and vegetables they could ever eat. Ooh. Um, how much agency did they feel that they have, you know, to Mark's point? Um, and, and to be told, well, you can eat from everything except for this one tree. I mean, that's just, that's just going to drive you crazy, right? You, you know, well, why, why not? What's it taste like? Uh, so, yeah. We're the same way today. We have plenty and we reach out for more and it gets us in trouble. Mm, right? Yeah. We have all we need. Yeah. Just like they did. They had all they need. Mm -hmm. I do think it's a fascinating story that, that, you know, is beautifully framed like that. You know, just like what Loretta's saying, you know, when is enough en enough? And, you know, are there limits to human to the human or not, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. experience or not, you know, and, and like you have the whole garden except the one tree, like that's it. Just one. It was, no say, to the desire. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful yeah, we, we live in a, a fluent society, so that makes us really tempting and guilty for this kind of a mm -hmm. sin. Is, as Loretta said, wanting more when we have more than enough. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that. Good, good. We have more than enough. All right. Shall we keep reading? Okay. All right. Psalm 130. Would someone like to read? Yeah, I'll read. Somebody okay. else will. Um, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness in order that you may be feared. I wait for you, O Lord. My soul waits, and your word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who keep watch for the morning, more than those who keep watch for the, oh, that's repeated itself, sorry. Um, Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption. For the Lord shall I redeem Israel from all their sins. Amen. Thank you. Well, I've made notes on, uh, on the same page of Genesis in Psalm 130, and uh, I remember I spoke up and said that in Genesis, you know, they distrusted God. Yes. And then in Psalm 130, <laughs> it's talking about trust in God. I mean, it's the, they, they parallel one another, of course, and that's why they've done the study this way. Mm -hmm. But we have so many promises there because if they trust the Lord, and it, it seems to me like it's... Um, sort of a testimony um, of trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, it, but which wasn't true in Genesis at all. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, so it sort of counterbalances lifting up trust, 
whereas Adam and Eve didn't. And they didn't. I think yet yeah, with you is forgiveness. That's that's uh -huh. so key um, because that's I think that's what keeps people coming back and trying to to live up to God's desires for us um, is that we know when we fail there is forgiveness. So mm -hmm. we can keep trying because we know we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Into the system. Mm -hmm. And knowing we have his forgiveness is I think what keeps us faithful. Mm -hmm. Keeps us faithful and keeps us moving, right? Because if we were very anxious about God's punishment, we might just curl up in a hole and quit trying. Yeah. You, you might know, well so, give up. Yeah, there's some freedom there to go out and give it your best shot, even if it's not perfect, you know, and that's the quote attributed to Luther, which is sin boldly, you know, he's not telling people to go out and do bad things. He's just saying, stop worrying about it, you know. Um, <clears throat> right, yeah, what else? Other thoughts, Ingrid, Mark? Covered it been covered huh yeah oh, well the only thing i was thinking is that you know the repetition of that verse about keeping watch in the morning you know for those who keep watch is uh i think it's because you know the guy who's keeping watch falling asleep <laughs> yeah so it's a little reminder you know sometimes yeah. you hear so the psalms have a lot of what they call thought rhyming yeah. so they will the the same idea will be repeated with just slightly different words. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the, the rhyming in terms of sounds, it's the rhyming in terms of thoughts. And so mm -hmm. the, the way this Psalm was translated, it almost seems like they're just repeating themselves. Um, you know, and to Mark's point, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to keep watch for the morning, you know, so a little extra reminder in there. I also think that these readings point to the problem of evil. You know, the classic question of theodicy, which is how can an all loving, all powerful, all knowing God allow for evil? You know, that, that is the most difficult perhaps theological question that we are faced with as people of faith. Um, and we're dealing with that this Sunday um, with Genesis and also <clears throat> particularly where it says here, if you were to keep watch over sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? You know, and you can read that a couple different ways, but one of the ways is like, um, If God, if, if God, you know, orients God's self toward, toward sin, it would, it would all be over in a way, you know, who, who could stand? Um, because we just wouldn't have a chance with, without God's forgiveness and love. You know, the, the power of evil is, um, terrifying. I think, um, com compared to our abilities, and um, and we're we're scratching at that question, at that issue in these readings. You know, how do we how do we deal with evil? With faith. Mm hmm. Good. Make faith your armor. Mm hmm. And I think if you're all armored up with faith, then you can say no to evil, because mm -hmm. I'm sure. We all have lived, most of us have lived more than 50, 60 years that we have been approached by evil. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I agree. Faith, faith is huge. It's, it is the greatest thing. Yeah. Um, 
The other thing this makes us think about is um, our theological anthropology. And so what I mean by that is how are we, what is human nature, right? This, we were talking about this with Genesis. Are we essentially good? Are we essentially bad? Are we both mostly good with a little bit of bad? You know, um, particularly when you think about people in vocations that have to deal with uh, the worst parts of society every day, you know, that affects how you look at the world. So, um, like law enforcement, for example, for men and women who serve in law enforcement, you know, every day they, they see really hard things, you know, and so how does that affect how you look at the world? Um, I've spoken with some people in law enforcement that say, you know, what gets me up in the morning is I tell myself, most people are good. And, and it's my job to protect those people and to, and to find those who, who are not you know, those, those who have lost their way. Um, and I get that. I, I get that way of looking at it. I've met other law enforcement who are people of faith who would, wouldn't quite say it like that. They would say, I've seen so much that I think any person under the right amount of pressure could crack. And, and do bad things, you know? Um, and those two views aren't necessarily in conflict either. You kind of think both, right? Most people are good unless they're put in a really, you know, compromising situation, you know, they, they could crack. Um, and it kind of gets back to that letter I was mentioning, you know, someone writing to me saying, you know, they, they just felt like they had to assure me that they were a good person. Um, and it was just interesting, like, well, you know, God is, God is for all of us, you know, even, even when we're not perfect. So this, you know, it, it, it makes us think about that, how, what, what is the nature of our humanity? What do you think about that? <clears throat> Satan and sinner at the same time. Satan and sinner at the same time. Tell us more about that, Mark. Yeah. 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 I think that's the nature of, of the human, of, well, the human condition. I don't know. It's just the nature of humanity. It's how we experience it, you know. I think, I think we all have the, I mean, it's part of just what it means to be human is that, you know, we, we have the capacity to do do great good and great evil and sometimes at the same time <laughs> so yeah it's a both and it's not an either or i think a lot of times we try to make it an either or but uh that's no, a both and okay and um the saint center um simultaneously saint and center um Insofar as we are saints, is that, um, you know, how, how does God factor into that equ equation or that identity of being a saint and sinner? What, what's God's role in it? Love. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Apply, apply love liberally. Okay. <laughs> loving, loving saints and sinners. And then does that love have an effect on the, the person being loved? Well, I would hope, yeah. you know, yeah. control of the lover. You know, I think it's, all you can do is love. You can't, you can't dictate the outcome. You can only show up to the moment. And kind of some of the pain of love, you know. Um, now in terms of our salvation, does God just leave that up to us or does God sort of unilaterally save people? Mm 
all we have to do is be forgiven mm-hmm. and his unfailing love will redeem us. Mm-hmm. 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 And then uh, it is. It's, so it's, so I'm going to, what I'm hearing you say, Loretta, is that it's more God's action than our own? Or am I not hearing you correctly? Well, yes. Yeah, we know he has steadfast love. Um, and he can't count on us to have a steadfast love. Yeah. You know, we fail. Just what Mark said about being saint and sinner. I think that's why it's discouraging, um, at least it is for me, in churches. Because you expect people to be faithful to the word and to be, um, that we can take them as they are. And then we find something horrible about them. And it's very hard to believe. I think we try to see the good in people. And then we find out um, that only God has an unfailing love. We we just um, don't always see the good and the bad in people. Mm-hmm. 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 We, we know that God reaches out and loves us. Um, some of us don't necessarily receive that mm-hmm. and make we all we all sin I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are people obviously who don't receive his love or don't do yeah so my question would be and it's just a question then what does he do with those people that he loves and they don't receive his love they they don't believe that he exists right right yeah, or or believe he exists, but cho- choose to reject. Right, exactly. That is. They're in the, the waiting. They're in the waiting room, Sandy. The waiting room. Yeah. <laughs> <They're in> the, <laughs> Isn't that why Jesus died on the cross to forgive all sinners? Because right. we are human beings and we sin. Yeah. And it is up to us. I'm going back to the old fashioned idea that God gave us free will and not to the animals that your will, you allow God, you let God be you, you know, come into you again, back to faith. And uh, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful notion to be faithful because again, it, clatters your whole body with that armor and makes you stronger and uh, whoever doesn't have that kind of feeling and like you said earlier pastor to the letter writer come to church yeah. experience that feeling yeah. you know be yeah. one with god in church yeah. and i i always tell people i go to church for me not mm-hmm. for you not for the pastor i go for me to be with God. I know I can be with God anywhere, which I am when I walk, when I'm out in the garden, you know. Yes. Um, Perhaps that lucidness comes when you mature more. It's not there with youth. Right. You know, with youth, you have lots of worries, especially when you have children. Right. And, uh, but as you have matured and as you have, in my case only, I only speak for myself, worked all your life yeah. and prepared for older age, middle age, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> then I think everything else is there, strongly represented. And the best part is when your grown, mature son says, well, mother, you know, I'm a man of faith. Mm-hmm. It just blows you away, mm-hmm. you know. It, mm-hmm. It's just, praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. I said, danke, mein Junge. I, that was the best thing I ever heard. Mm-hmm. So, so in answer to my question, what you're saying is God grants the forgiveness for everybody. And if you're believing while you're here, you're going to have, um, then that, that's going to guide you. That's going to have you have positive feelings, positive reactions. So embracing that faith and embracing God while you're here is a gift. 
salvation. Yeah, but that even if you don't, there's still forgiveness. Is yeah, that, well, that's how yeah, I, I think talk. so. Yeah, that's what I believe. I'm just yeah. asking. Yes. Right. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. That's what I heard you saying. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. Absolutely. I want yeah. to be sure I was receiving your message accurately. Because yeah. that's, that would be how I would look at things. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good clarifying point there. And, and that's, to me, what grace is, the name of our church. It's that God forgives first, loves first, unconditionally, and that, and that our faith is a response to the grace. Yeah. All right, should we continue on? Yeah. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Would anybody like to read? Okay, I guess it's my turn. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Since my number 13 is in there. There we go. <laughs> okay, I'll make it a little bit bigger here. There we go. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. If we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building. Uh, Pastor? Oh, sure. Okay, I'll start again. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. All right. Oh, let me pull that back up. That's there was good good things to read there. Thank you, Ingrid. Great job reading. You're welcome. All right. So, any thoughts on this? Second Corinthians. Well, I like the, the reminder that we should fix our eyes on not what is seen, but that the unseen. What is un, unseen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lesser are those who have seen. Sorry. Go ahead, Sandy. I'm sorry. No, Sandy, I cut you off. Um, just so we do not lose heart. That, that just says that keeps us strong. You know, it, it keeps us focused and strong and striving and, and receiving and it's, it's good not to lose heart. That keeps you, mm -hmm. keeps you moving. Like mm -hmm. when the pandemic hits, you know, you can't lose heart. You have to realize what's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what do you think is most important? That we're just blessed mm -hmm. <laughs> by God. Mm -hmm. In bad circumstances, he's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Well, that, this goes back to Loretta saying what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. Well, faith. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't put your arms around it. You can't touch it. We have it in our hearts. Mm -hmm. So do not lose your heart. Mm -hmm. Keep the faith. And that comes by focusing on God's blessings. Yeah. Gosh, you make it sound like God's a big softy. 
<laughs> well, he's good. Just he's just making this God person seem like he's just so good and loving. Well, he is. What about I mean, the? Come on, he loves us. <laughs> Human nature. <laughs> we with all our squiggly ideas and everything and our behavior. I mean, hello. <laughs> wow, you're just you're all just so enamored with God. Yeah, because we're Christians. <laughs> oh, I'm talking to a bunch of Christians. <laughs> yes, you are. Oh, wow. Okay, you all right. Be part of it. <laughs> I better watch my language then. Excuse me if yeah, I swore yeah, yeah. earlier. <laughs> we have not lost heart. <laughs> That's right. Persistent ones, too. You see us every Thursday and Sunday. There you go, sister ladies. <laughs> You don't have to watch the language with me. Not about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm sure we're all linguistically inclined at times. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, you, very, very good reflections here. And, and it, is, it is tremendously freeing, liberating to really focus on God's grace. Because it's just like the whole world opens before you. You know, and it's not like this lonely, difficult road. It's, it's, it's lots of roads, many choices, God's abundance, you know, focusing on, on all the things that God is doing. It, it lifts the load off of us. You know, it, it gives us that lightness of being. So I, I think you're all right on. It's, it's wonderful. I think that's the senior citizen verse. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. And then you, know, you read about, um, and, and I know there's more to it than what I'm saying, but um, they say that many older people have really had a renewal in their faith because you've been raised with it. But I think you reflect on it more as you're older. Yeah. 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 That's why I was thinking of moving right into retirement, taking an early retirement so I could be more spiritual. <laughs> You'd be bored. <laughs> Definitely. Uh... So one thing that Paul drew my attention to is right here, it says, I believed and so I spoke. And that makes me think about the courageous conversations that we have sometimes, you know, like it can be intimidating to speak the truth um, like Adam and Eve, you know, Adam had trouble just confessing what he had done. You know, he made up some excuse and then he made up another excuse by blaming it on Eve. And when, when we are faithful, when we have faith, when we believe in God's blessings, that frees us up to be more truthful. Um, whether that's our own speaking for ourselves and admitting our mistakes, or if it's naming an uncomfortable truth in the world, you know, like Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, you know, talking about global climate change or, you know, um, that faith gives us that boldness to, to speak, mm -hmm. to speak about the truth, even if it's not always popular, you know. Um, and that, and then that, that gets echoed down here, you know, there can be consequences to speaking the truth. You know, you can be intimidated. There can be physical suffering when we think about the early Christians who were martyred. Um, and, and even today, you know, you can, you know, get bullied or whatever. And having this faith in a spiritual reality that is in this one, right? Again, Paul was not against the physical world, but he was just saying there's more to it. Um, so that when we see the, the wasting away and what have you, um, to have faith in a, in a greater reality than we're aware of gives us the, the confidence to speak the truth and to speak God's word. <clears throat> the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's very repetitious, too, 
-hmm. that things we can see and cannot see, but it always ends with number three, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Always coming back to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then this one, for we know that the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Which also makes me think about the resurrection of Jesus. Because when Jesus resurrected, he was not just <clears throat> a ghost. He had a spiritual body. And, you know, heaven is a really big mystery. But there's something about it that, even though we can't see it, it's even more real than the reality that we see. Um, Elon Musk is this, you know, now richest man in the world um, for now. And he's an engineer. He's the guy that did Tesla and SpaceX. Well, he was on Saturday Night Live. And he's controversial, you know. He, he says some controversial things. But... He has been one that, along with other scientists, that hypothesize that all of the reality that we see is sort of like a virtual reality, you know, like a computer simulation, and that the true reality we can't even see. It's it's we're we're, we're sort of trapped within a matrix. Um, and as crazy and sci-fi as that it sounds, it actually has some connections to this, you know. To, to our ancient Christian view of the world. So it's interesting how things come full circle, you know. Um, so maybe Elon Musk would like to join our church and be a practice his good stewardship, you know, that would be. Yeah. Cool. yeah. All right, should we turn to the gospel? Yep. Okay. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark chapter three. Jesus Glory went, to you, Lord. Amen. Jesus went home. And the crowd came together again so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. And then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they said to him and called him, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The gospel of the Lord. Be to God. Thanks be to God. All right, so don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because yeah. that is not the thing you want to do. We just, I just touched on that with you recently, Pastor, uh, uh -huh. because of something that happened. And, um, but yes, blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Right. Are you talking about that time I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Was it what, Pastor? No, I'm sorry. I was trying to joke. I said, you said we had talked about it recently, and I said, was that the time that I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, no, and, and I am 
advocating there. I would never, never do that, never try to do that. But what do you, I mean, what does it mean? What do you think it means here to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What is Jesus talking about? Such a bad thing. I mean, this is a really bad thing. What does he mean? Well, you're speaking against the Spirit. Okay. Um, you're speaking. Um, yeah. You're, you're setting yourself against God, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're speaking against God. And, and they talked about, when you read about Beelzebub. Uh-huh, Beelzebub. Um, yeah. And... Um, and I had to go look at my Wycliffe commentary because you see it spelled it apparently different ways. Mm -hmm. um, there's Be Beelzebub, mm -hmm. and, but it's, he's described as the prince of demons. Mm -hmm. But I went to my Wycliffe commentary because I always get confused on, on um, Beelzebub. Mm -hmm. I don't know this for sure, but is Beelzebul also translated Lord of the Flies? What is the what, Pastor? Lord of the Flies, like the book was named oh. after. Oh, yes. Oh, that's right. Hmm. So, I guess. Uh -huh, go ahead. Um, couple, I was just going to say, I guess people question and just say, how can you blast me against the Holy Spirit? Yeah. And I guess it's like you said, then that's maybe the denial. Mm -hmm. The denial of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Where well, where does it leave the rest of the humans that don't believe in the Holy Spirit? I mean, there's religions out there that don't believe in that. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and or Jesus. Right. And now it says they can never have forgiveness. But in the last passage, we had said that there is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. so exactly. This is, you know, the Bible is not a systematic theology. It is a collection of sacred words that sometimes seem to contradict each other. And that makes it very interesting to interpret. Depends on, too, the translation, right? Greek, Roman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, so one way to think about this is, um, you know, I was talking to someone and they were reading it and they said, it sounds like even Jesus had his limits. You know, like, I'll forgive a lot, but there's some limits. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, that that person said that? Even Jesus has his limits. I thought, I thought, wow, that really, in a few words, you really kind of sum up a very deep thought. Does Jesus have limits? What do you think? No right or wrong answer. We're just talking. You know, you're not... Not going to be judged. Just don't, just don't blaspheme the spirit while you do it. You'll be okay. What do you think? Well, I personally think not. So okay, and that's okay. Yeah, and you think not because he just the uh, kind of a universal forgiveness. Everything that we learned, mm -hmm. yeah, as humans, everything that we were taught, mm -hmm. everything that you pick up as an adult. Mm -hmm. just what, what leads you to believe that there's no limits to Jesus' love. Yeah. Well, yeah. I believe, yeah, I yeah. believe there isn't. He yeah. loves us eternally forever and ever. Yeah, good. With all his might and strength. Good. And protects us. Well, he's, his love many times has protected me through my life. Right. In the last 50, 60 years. And I'm forever grateful for that. Mm -hmm. so. Good, good. Right, what else do you think? Is there limits? Does Jesus have limits? Mark, I saw you unmute. Are you queuing up to share a thought there? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to think he uh, does. Um, okay. I think it's part of the human condition to be limited. And, you know, if, if, as you know, we confess truly um, in the creed uh, about the nature of Jesus being truly human, then, you know, limitation is a part of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, so what, so are you saying then that Jesus was limited, but that was coming from his humanity more than his divinity? Yeah. And so does God have limits? Yeah. God, so would you, so, so would, would God the Father have limits? You know, I'll ask him one day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and again, there's, you know, we're just talking here, so don't, there's no, there's no pressure or anything. And, um, no, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, I mean, to understand, to, to, you know, be able to relate to us, to, you know, tell God's story, you know, God chose to, to have an expression that was human and truly human and fully human, not, not a, uh, not God in a, in a human meat suit, but God in a, in humanity. And so I, you know, there comes a time I have to sleep. You know, I have to, I just have, I, you know, I hit the wall and, and I, and I just have to sleep. I mean, this body just doesn't do, you know, turning 50, this body, I, you know, I fell a couple of weeks ago and like falling at age 50 is different than falling at age 30. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I'll try falling at 80. Uh, I'll affirm that. Right. These are these are very real limitations of the human condition, you know, that affect the human spirit and, you know, affect what it means. And so I, you know, to say, you know, I just I don't think the I don't think love makes sense outside of the limitations of heartbreak, you know, and um, uh, that's the human condition is heartbreaking. So. Well, and isn't that what the cross is all about? You see, you see the limits. You 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 see a bound, a bounded. You know, sometimes people talk about God's love is boundless, um, which I get, and and yet Jesus on the cross, he's bound to that cross, literally, physically, and spiritually. Yeah, but I don't think that makes him limitless. I mean, this is all part of the story. Jesus mm -hmm. being crucified. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So bounded, but not limited. In my mind and heart, yes. Okay. Yeah. Would anyone else want to weigh, weigh in? Is, is, does Jesus have his limits? Uh, Sandy, Loretta? Or you can pass. You could say pass. Well, I, I, I remember when Mark interjected about the human side um, of God, and he certainly hit his limits. We saw many examples uh, where he would. Um, so it, but it's a difficult, it's a difficult um, question. Um, um, we have the promise of forgiveness, and and he said he will always be steadfast in his love for those of us. But but I but I do think people can deny all of that and go go to their death screaming at him that I do not believe in you. I do not. And um, so I think there's probably times when people have removed themselves from God. And he has never removed us. Right. No, it's a it's a hard decision. Right.
Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I mean, um, in the C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, the people who are in hell, they basically choose to be there, you know, uh, in a nutshell. They are given infinite opportunities to go to heaven, and, and they, they might, you know, it's, you know, the story goes on, you know, but um, th those who, who choose to not be with God is, it is portrayed but by C.S. Lewis as their <clears throat> choice. Um, and, and this is all, he's all writing uh, fiction after death, sort of like the after death reality. And it's a good book. Um, and, you know, is that what Jesus is saying here? That you are sort of eternally in sin, but even eternity, it kind of depends on you, right? Like, so long as you hang on to that sin, you know, that blaspheming, setting yourself against God, as long as you hang on to that, you're, you're pushing yourself away and that'll go on forever, potentially. Um, but if you relent, um, or if the, if God helps you relent, then, then I do think that there could be forgiveness. I tend, so, so to put my cards on the table, when I read this, I actually think this is something we are all capable, a sin we are all capable of doing kind of like, eating eating the fruit on the tree um i don't think that there's some small subset of humanity that blasphemes against the holy spirit i think it's a problem we all have and i think jesus is so harsh in his words to bring to our attention the consequences and our total dependence on god's grace you know, the Calvinists talk about total depravity. Um, we, we all need the forgiveness. You know, none of us gets there on our own. That's what this really does to me. It really just drives home that, that need, you know, for, for God's forgiveness. Indeed. So I'm going to say good um, bye to you. Yep. There's some brothers. There's I need to be on my way, but uh, including Bye, Loretta. And thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, okay. Bye, love. Bye-bye. Yeah, and it is that time. So we, we can pray. Any other kind of final thoughts on this one? Yeah. All right. Well, good, excellent reflections from everybody. It's a, they're challenging text, so you can pray for me <laughs> for the sermon for this Sunday. Um, <laughs> You know, the problem of evil is like kind of a hard one. So, um, well, let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.